So in this episode, I want to talk about economic trends or business trends that are going to shape 2022. You don't want to miss this. Stay tuned. You are listening to The Leadersmith, Darren Gertis. Okay, so in this episode, I'm going to be talking about economic trends that are shaping 2022. Uh, New Year's Day was not too long ago in 2022. I remember in New Year's Day in 2020 being like, glad that's over with. And then we had 2021, which was another dumpster fire. And um, we want to look forward and see if 2022 is going to be another dumpster fire or whether things will change. And uh, I found this fascinating article in the Financial Times, 10 Economic Trends That Could Be could Define 2022. I'm going to cover their trends, add a little bit of my own um concepts or ideas that I I think ought to be added to it. Uh, and then we'll try to get a sense of what's going on. Okay. So this article is by Rachir Sharma in uh, the Financial Times, as I said, and he has 10 trends. Now, the first one's really interesting. It's a baby bust. Now, you would think that all this time that you're, you know, quarantined and you can't go anywhere and whatever would actually lead to a baby boom. Um, and that was a joke initially back in uh, in March or so, May of 2020. But that's not really what's going on. We're, we're couples <laughs> apparently had other things to do. Netflix or other things were um, more on their minds than um, uh, creating the next generation. Now, granted, some people are thinking, oh, I don't want to bring a child into this terrible world. OK, I get that. But. It's declining and a baby bust is already happening in 51 different countries. Uh, And so as the world population shrinks, that's going to put pressure on uh, other people to make up the difference in order to. So it's going to have an effect somewhere down the line if it stays as a legitimate trend. Now, what's interesting is if it stays as a legitimate trend. There was an article that was talking about, is this a flurry? Is this a blizzard? Or is this uh, an ice age? So this meaning COVID, is it a a flurry, a blizzard, or an ice age? Well, it's not a flurry. We know that COVID is more than just a little tiny flurry that's come and gone. Maybe we're in a blizzard. But if we're in a blizzard or an ice age, either way, and this trend holds, we're going to see some pretty significant fallout from that kind of demographic shift. Okay, the second one was peak China. Um, Now, that's really interesting because we see a lot in the news about China, China this, China that. China's causing our, our, uh, you know, productivity or labor shortages, uh, our operation chain shortages. Um, China's saber rattling about Taiwan. But here the argument is saying that China, while we're jacked up, China is even more jacked up and they're handling it poorly. Uh, And China is going to be starting to have uh, larger headaches than what we have. What was really interesting was that they were talking about a correlation between GDP growth in China and other emerging emerging countries. It used to be like China was right there with them, and that's fallen off the charts. I mean, so China may not be the engine of growth, particularly as we revamp our own supply chain to start to make things here rather than be dependent on China, given what's going on in the world with COVID and other uncertainties, and so. Maybe China has peaked and it's not going to be like, you know, think back in if you have this kind of memory. So I'm almost 50 uh, and I have uh, some memory of things that happened. I'm trying to remember who it was. Uh, there was a philosopher. It wasn't Marcus Aurelius. It was somebody else of that kind of caliber that said until 40, everything's new. And then after that, everything else is uh, just in kind of repeat. You've seen it before. Well, I remember seeing this before and we thought Japan was a was a difficulty. Like if you grew up in the 80s, Japan was buying all this real estate and a real threat and going to run our automakers and our electronics out of business and that kind of thing and then japan peaked and japan hit this um this demographic issue that they had where they didn't have enough younger generation and you know maybe something's going on here with china as well i don't know but just 
wait and see. Okay, the next one is the debt trap. So global debt is beyond unbelievable. Um, our debt, our national debt has about tripled, maybe. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we used to talk about how we had a single digit trillion dollars worth of national debt and how this is an, a, a pox on our children and, and a curse. We're now into the 30,000 trillion or 30 trillion dollar range. I mean, it's unbelievable. So we're not the only ones either. Many countries around the world have tried to get out of this crisis by having their central banks print money. And so 25 countries, the article says, including the U.S., have debt above 300 percent of GDP. 300 percent. So what that means is, let's say you make fifty thousand dollars a year and you have a debt of one hundred fifty thousand. That is essentially what we're talking about. That's the kind of debt the U.S. has right now. And it's not just the U.S. So here's what's likely to happen down the line. Down the line, somebody somewhere is going to default and that's going to trigger other defaults and that's going to have a massive catastrophic defaulting wave across the world. That's my prediction. But this debt trap is... It's bad. It's, it's it's just bad. I mean, I, I don't even know how to describe it other than bad. Now, coupled with that debt trap, which we're going to see long-term consequences later on, we have inflation right now. But they say in the article, it's not 1970-style inflation. Um, but, you know, we're not going to see the double-digit inflation of the 1970s that some people are saying. I, I don't know that that's not true. I hope it's not true. I pray that it's not true. What we've seen, I, I saw an article a few weeks back that talked about uh, skimpflation. Now, skimpflation is just you get a little bit less, but you pay the same price because they're trying not to make it feel like whatever. So um, the, the example that I use is there's... Uh, a higher end grocery store around the corner for me um, that they have things like sushi and another like they have like their own little in-house sushi store within the store. And I used to get this this thing. I, I liked it. It was like um, it wasn't sushi like in a, in a roll. It was in like this little wrap, like this little um, I, I don't know, they a pocket of things that they put the sushi in. Well, they used to give me uh, five of these for five dollars, six dollars, something like that. Now they sell four in the pack for the same price. That's skimflation, and I think you'll see more and more of that as we move around the corner into 2022. Um, so it's not going to be, according to the article at least, it's not going to be 1970s style uh, inflation with double digits, but you know, it's going to be something. I mean, we were already feeling something. The Biden administration has said it repeatedly. Oh, this is only temporary. I don't believe that for a moment. Now, they also ended this by saying that, that I'm quoting here, financial markets have grown four to five times, uh, four times the size of the global economy. And when markets crater, deflation often follows. So if there's a big collapse in um in the market somehow a big you know black friday or not black friday black monday kind of event that just tanks the economy then you could see some deflation and deflation is good and bad it hurts when it happens but it actually might be a good thing in some sense although it's just going to create a terrific pain along the way i mean it, any scenario here is going to be terrific pain, terrific long-term pain or terrific acute pain, but it's going to be pain. Okay, now next, greenflation. Now, greenflation is that we have adopted a green is good kind of mentality. And because of that, we're reallocating things in such a way that we're pursuing environmentalist kind of agenda. Well, with that, as we reallocate, some things are more prized than others now. So um, I have no desire to go buy a, uh, a hybrid car. It seems uh, silly to me to pay all that much for something that's not going to give that much of a bang for the buck. Maybe somewhere the technology would be great and they'll put solar panels on cars and we'll be zooming around on those when the solar panel technology gets better and it'll be 
not cost prohibitive for the technology or something. But right now, I just I don't see it. But greenflation does this. Um, while we're adopting this new stance, what we're doing is we're starting to buy different things in different quantities. So, for example, green metals. They talked about copper and aluminum. Um, Copper and aluminum are raw materials and lots of green initiatives, uh, as opposed to, say, oil in the ground or things along those lines. So when they buy up more copper and aluminum to put into hybrid vehicles, let's say, they can't use it for other purposes. And so what's chasing that price up is going to cause other things not to be produced or to be produced more expensively. So that's greenflation. Okay, the next one is the productivity paradox. You had productivity initially surge in 2020. People went home, like we were like, uh oh, the whole economy is collapsing. People go home, they start working at home, and then they're working longer hours with greater burnout. And the peak productivity that we thought that we we're going to have. Uh, it might not be what we thought. It might have been like a certain burst, like we could have gotten that out of a sprint, but we can't get that out of a marathon. We don't know yet. It's too early to tell. I do know this, though, that we're spending billions of dollars on home tracking software for uh, monitoring work at home. And I, I don't know that it's going to be the same. There's just something different about working in a, in a home environment than in an organization where you can rub shoulders with your colleagues. It may work for some people. I don't see why it wouldn't work for somebody who's editing a book. Uh, you might even be more productive when you're doing that, uh, as long as they can you know, mix with people at certain points along the way. But for other people who need to work you know, with people in a team that that may or may not work at any rate the productivity paradox we like working at home some people are loath to go back to the office but we might not see the productivity that we thought that we were going to have okay the next one is data localization um okay so the virus hit and we start looking about you know, I mean, the, the internet starts, you know, uh, blowing up, right? I mean, we spend more time, more data, whatever, but the internet doesn't work the same everywhere, okay? Like in the United States, it's basically a, a free and open exchange of ideas. I mean, with the exception of Facebook and the way the algorithm works and Twitter maybe, or something along those lines, but essentially you can put anything anywhere. Not so in China, not so in uh, Russia, Saudi Arabia, other places along those lines. Um, they are really clamping down on on you know what information gets into the country because they're you know this is what dictators have to do. Okay, so that's another trend. I don't know that that affects us nearly as much as some of the other trends here, but it's it's a legit thing. Okay, bublets deflate. This is the next one. Bublets deflate. Okay, so there have been bubbles during the inflation. A, a bubble is when things get overpriced because pe more people are chasing that particular thing than before. And I'd like to see some of these bubbles deflate. So, for example, I had to buy, I had to spend uh, eight thousand and change, almost nine thousand dollars, in order to buy a two thousand five minivan. My minivan, or I, so I have to replace this this car, but. Here's what happened. The supply chain jacked up. Oh, by the way, if you want to see a fascinating video about the supply chain, there's out of stock, the supply chain crisis. It's by the Discovery Channel. Please look it up. It is absolutely fascinating to watch. Um, and it'll help you understand just how amazingly jacked up we are right now. I mean, it's just, we've got some significant issues. So here's what happens, and, and this is right out of the documentary. Um, the make the big three automakers said, you know what, people are going to be driving less during COVID, so they ordered fewer microchips. On top of that, the micro there's only like one place in the world that makes most of the microchips, and that factory shuts down a lot. 
And so there's fewer of these microchips so they can make fewer new automobiles. Well, if there are fewer newer automobiles, people have to look to the second hand market. And when they look to the second hand market now, the price of the second hand vehicles have gone up. In fact, the price of second hand uh, cars have gone up something like 40 percent or something uh, since since the pandemic started. That's why I didn't just get a bad deal. That's about the best deal that I could find for my 2005 minivan. Um, okay, so bublets will deflate mercifully. I, I hope not to have to spend like that again for uh, another minivan uh, or another vehicle or something along those lines. But think about other bublets. So, for example, um, early on, a blind man could see that Peloton stock and Netflix stock would be great. Right. I mean, who wouldn't want to be in those? But then as we started to emerge from the initial shutdown, Peloton stock went way down. It deflated. So it went up, but it will also go down. So he he gave examples in the article of bublets like cryptocurrencies, clean energy, tech companies that just don't actually show any earnings. And they went up and they're also going to go down. So um you just got to watch and wait. Okay, next thing is retail cooling. And here in the US and Europe, millions of people open trading accounts and they're getting into uh, you know, the market like they have not done before. And, and part of the reason is that they're more flush with money than they've ever been before because uh, the federal government sending checks and, you know, that's what's giving us the trillions of dollars of debt. And so they're, you know, putting money into the market. That's great, except it's like we didn't learn our lesson. About, it's, it's like we're repeating the 1920s, the 1920s with the pandemic. And then on, now this wasn't associated with the uh, well, it's actually like late teens into the 20s with the pandemic. And then what happened in the 1930s? People are buying on margin. People are not just opening these trading accounts, but they're also buying or, you know, borrowing money to buy stock because they're they're looking at inflation and going, well, I got to do something about it. And so we might be recreating that cycle. Uh, it, it's too early to tell, but that could be a real problem. Okay, physical matters. And this is, I think, the last one of of the group. And it's talking about like, you know, sometimes we talk about, well, we're just going to do everything digitally. Uh, The metaverse on Facebook is, is, uh, you know, going to be the new big wave. I'm not sure. Um, Physical actually matters behind. And he said this, uh, behind every avatar is a human. And the labor shortages are lifting wages, even in the jobs most threatened by automation, such as truck driving. Requiems for the tangible are premature. And I think that that's true. Now, things are changing to digital, but I don't think it's going to be like uh, the movie Ready Player One, where everything just retreats into a digital oasis. I, I don't I don't think that. But there are changes like I actually I see a silver lining in the way that we're reallocating. So, for example, I went to Lowe's the other day, scanned a little you know, receipt, and a locker popped open, and I got my thing. I didn't have to interact with a human being. You can go to uh, Little Caesars and do the same kind of thing. You, you scan you know, or type in your code, and out comes your pizza. You don't have to talk to a human being. Those things are probably pretty good trends. I tried this with Walmart. Walmart's uh, creating a system like this. Uh, we got a free trial to a delivery system, not actually physically going there because they kind of screw up the order sometimes, but not physically going there where they were actually going to deliver my groceries to my house. And it would be like a hundred dollar fee a year or something along those lines. Deliver your groceries. Well, a couple things happen. One, they uh, they decided to add in a ten dollar tip to the driver, which nullifies the whole value of this. Which I, I I get it; the driver has to get their tip, but you know, create your system like Amazon. I don't tip the Amazon driver. Like, figure out your system, guys. Anyway, so 
I, and you could change that. We didn't, but you could. And then the, the thing came three hours after the window. Like you have a window for, you know, two to five that it's going to be delivered. And it w- hadn't come three hours later. So we just canceled it because Walmart, it's too premature. They don't have their act together yet for that. But wouldn't that be great if I didn't have to go to Walmart <laughs> to get my groceries or I could just have things come to me? That would be a great trend. And I would uh, appreciate that kind of trend. Um, there was a, an article I just stumbled over where Whole Foods was doing that, but drivers are, uh, not drivers, the customers are balking at paying 10 bucks per delivery because that's their business model. Um, so we have yet to see how some of these trends will shake out, but there are very distinct trends that are moving us a particular direction. And if you pay attention, you can capitalize on some of these. Okay. So that's all that I have for right now. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this. I I wonder what other trends are out there or what you see. And I'd be interested in hearing from you about what you think of as other trends. But as leaders, you need to be aware of the trends. You need to have the foresight to be able to see what's coming down the line and being able to adjust to those trends. Okay, so that leads me to my quotation for contemplation for today, which comes from Victor Hugo, who said, there's nothing like a dream to create the future. Wow, that's a great quote. All right. Thank you for your time. And I hope that this helps you become the kind of leader that you would want to follow. Thank you.